David G. Simmons is the head developer, uh, head of developer relations at QuestDB. Um, he is joining us all the way from North Carolina today and has gotten up very bright and early to uh, give us all a talk today. Um, a little bit about David is that he's been working in IoT since before it was even a thing. And he normally shares the office with his two furry coworkers, which I don't remember, are, did, were they cats? Or are they dogs, David? They are giant dogs. I have two Rottweilers, but actually neither one of them is in here today. They're otherwise occupied. Okay, well maybe we can see them later. All right, David, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can take it away whenever you want. Okay. I'm hoping everybody can see that. Yes. Yep, we see you. Let me just do a quick reminder. Please send your questions throughout the chat. David will be talking for about 20 minutes and then we'll also have time for questions. And now I'm going to shut up. So, actually, if you stick around to the end, I'm going to show you some really amazing stuff at the end. I have a demo that just blows my mind. So, um, that's sort of the hook to keep you, to keep you here the whole time. Um, but I sort of cross out the Internet of Things because I'm, I am becoming less and less interested in the actual things and more interested in the data. Um, I typically ask how many people have heard of, you know, QuestDB, but since nobody can raise their hand, and I'm pretty sure not many people have heard of it, uh, I'm just going to dive in a little bit and talk about sort of what is time series data and why does it matter for uh, or IOT. So time series data is really, basically, it's any data that has a timestamp attached to it, right? It records every change. So anytime the data changes over time, you get the new data with the new timestamp. It's typically a lot of data. And I'll go into a little bit about how much data we're actually talking about uh, in a little bit. Um, and it's from a lot of sources. If you're doing a, an IoT deployment, you're typically collecting lots and lots of data from lots of different uh, things that you are instrumenting, and so it's a bunch of different sources. And we're, you're typically collecting it so that you can gain insights into what's going on and make decisions for whatever business you're in based on that data. So it's really important to be able to collect the data uh, in a timely fashion. So now we'll talk about what is IoT data. Well, IoT data is basically a sensor reading at a time, right? That should look really familiar from the last slide, right? So if I'm collecting my temperature data on a timeline, right, I'm looking at the, the temperature change over time. And part of why I may be doing that is so that I can try to predict what's hap going to happen in the future, right? I want to predict what the trend is so that I can make uh, decisions based on where I think this data is going. Right? That can be really helpful. So in the beginning of the Internet of Things, it was really all about the things. And everybody talked about the number of things that were being added and the number of things that were going to be on the Internet of Things. And almost nobody talked about data and what we were going to do with all that data. And that's actually still true a lot today. It's, it's kind of alarming to me, but that's mostly because I'm a, a data person. Right? So since it's about the data, or at least it should be, we need to sort of ask ourselves why we're doing this, right? We're collecting this data so that we can react to it, so that we can model systems, do things like build digital twins, so that we can predict the future and make decisions based on where things are going, right? This is really true for if you're doing things like uh, uh, futures trading or options trading, or if you are trying to predict uh, machine health by collecting data on all the various aspects of a uh, machine. Uh, GE does this with their jet engines. It's really important to collect all this data and 
analyze it so that you can sort of predict the future, right? And it's to really solve complex problems. That's one of the things that digital twins are really good for is collect all the data, model the system, and then we can tweak it in our model and see what's gonna happen. Now I don't care about this because nobody's traveling anymore, right? But back when I was traveling, I really wanted them to do it this way rather than, you know, well, what happens if we tweak the jet engine this way and I happen to be on that plane? Not a great tent. So why would you just not use something like, you know, Postgres or MySQL or Oracle or something, right? Time series data is special in that the time portion of it is really what I call a first class citizen, right? Um, dealing with things in time order is hard. And so having that time element be a critical part of the data is something that's not necessarily looked at in regular uh, RDBMSs. Time series databases are typically purpose built and I'm a big proponent in using the right tool for the right job. Now you wouldn't know that if you saw me doing stuff around the house, but generally I'm a big proponent of doing, using the right tool for the right job. And time series databases are really the right tool for dealing with time series data. That's why they're called time series databases, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So when we're talking about billions of things, right? In the internet of things, typically people are talking about billions of things, depending on which analysts you talk to at which point in which day, they're gonna say there's gonna be 20 billion things or 100 billion things by 2025. And it really depends on, on which analyst you're listening to, right? But all of that is really still about just the things and not the data that's coming off of them. So this is a, a chart showing the connected devices in, uh, in billions over the, over the course of, you know, some 2015 to 2025, 10 years, right? And of course the, you know, it's projections on out, but that's still a lot of things. But it's really about the data. And so we're gonna do a little bit of math. 75 billion things, 10 bytes of data per thing, every minute of every hour of every day forever. That's about 750 gigabytes a minute. That's a petabyte a day. And the thing about the Internet of Things is once you start turning these devices on, you typically don't turn them off. So once it starts sending data to you, it is gonna send data to you forever. So you're looking at a petabyte a day of data and that's forever. That's gonna add up really quickly. And the real question is, how are you gonna handle that data? What are you gonna do in order to be able to actually get insight into that data? Because it's a lot, right? So we need to collect the data, we need to analyze it, we need to interpret it, visualize it, and react to it, right? And store it. All of these things are really important for IoT. And in large part, you need to look at your data as how am I going to react to this data and do I really need it? Because with if you just collect everything, you're gonna quickly overwhelm yourself and not be able to interpret that data in a meaningful way, right? So managing the data becomes as big an issue as uh, managing the devices. And trust me, managing the devices is gonna be a lot. I wrote a blog post probably six or seven years ago now about how we're going to handle just changing batteries on 75 million devices, right? Not all, all of them will be battery operated, but enough of them will that we're gonna need an army of people to just manage the devices. But on top of that, we're gonna to have to manage all this data. And at a petabyte of data a day, that's a lot of data that's gonna to have to be managed and we're gonna to have to find ways of being able to interpret it and, and analyze it and store it 
and even get rid of it that makes sense. So I always say data first, things second, right? You start with the answers that you're looking for. What am I trying to, what answers am I trying to get from my Internet of Things deployment, right? And then what data do I need to get those answers, right? So if I'm trying to do predictive maintenance on machines, then I want answers on when things are gonna go bad, right? And so now I move to what data do I need in order to make those decisions? Do I need vibrational analysis? Do I need number of hours in operation? Do you know what sorts of data do I need to get those answers? And then the last thing is to finish with the devices that I need to get that data. Typically, IoT goes about it the other way. We start with, okay, let's deploy a bunch of devices and start gathering data, and then let's see what we can do with it. And from my perspective, that's exactly the wrong way to go. You need to start with, what am I trying to do here, and what data do I need to do that, and then that'll lead me to what devices do I need to deploy. Because it's about the data and it's not about the things. And it's not just about the data, it's actually about what, I can, what I'm gonna do with that data and what sorts of answers I'm looking for and how that data can help me to transform my business or make better business decisions or, or build better widgets if I'm building widgets, right? And I've been saying that data must be actionable to be useful for well over a decade. If I'm not gonna be able to take action based on the data I'm collecting, if I don't know what I'm doing with it, then why am I collecting it, right? I'm just wasting time. And finally, it's really about managing the data after I collect it. Right? It's gonna be a ton of data, so what am I gonna do with it? Really, what am I gonna do with this data? So let's get to QuestDB, which is where I work. It is a very high performance time series database. And I'm gonna give you a, a demo of just how high performance it is. It's really sort of mind bending how fast it is. It's all open source. Uh, it's mostly written in Java. Um, and it is a relational SQL model. So you can actually query it with standard SQL. So there's a much less lower barrier to entry for a lot of folks because SQL's a known entity, right? Most uh, database folks know SQL and can write it. And it is, I, I can't emphasize how blazingly fast it is. And that's sort of the demo I'm gonna show at the end is really how, uh, how fast it is. So I've now spent sort of two thirds of this talking about data, and this was an IoT talk. So let's do a little bit of talking about things, because without the things, there's no internet of things, and, and they really are what generate the data. They collect it, they're the they're sort of the, some people say it's the last mile, I look at it as the first mile. It's really where the, you know, where the data comes from and where the decisions are gonna come from. So let's go ahead and make a thing. I have here, I will hold it up so you can see it, um, a little Arduino temperature and humidity sensor. It's an ESP8266 and a, a DHT11 sensor. Um, the sensor is probably the worst temperature and humidity sensor I've ever come across, so I don't recommend it, but they're super cheap, right? Um, I think the sensor was like a dollar and the, uh, the Arduino board was uh, like $2.50 US. So they're super cheap and I'm, I use them for a lot of things because I have bags of them lying around. I literally buy them uh, by, you know, 50 at a time because they're so cheap. So how to build it, it's, there's not much code, right? This is just what I'm showing you here is the Arduino code that is basically how to uh, how to read this data. 
and then I'm going to gather it up in a, in a loop and I'm going to send it every once a second, right? I'm going to get the temperature and the humidity and I'm going to make myself a buffer and does my pointer work on this? No, it does not. Um, I'm going to put all of the data into that buffer and then I'm just going to send it in a UDP packet. So, all right, so before you say, but UDP is unreliable, it's right there in the name. UDP is actually quite reliable. It's only unreliable if the receiver can't handle the buffer. And since I'm using QuestDB, I actually know that the receiver can handle the buffer because it is really, really fast at reading data. So I'm just going to build this string and send it off. And if you were paying attention, you'll notice that, yeah, that looked a lot like influx line protocol. And it is. Influx line protocol is, uh, you know, lots of folks use it. It's a very compact data protocol for sending uh, data to a database. Um, right now, we're only doing supporting it in UDP, but our TCP version is going to be released literally any minute. Um, I was just talking with the engineers this morning and they are just finalizing all of the uh, comments on the pull requests and all of that so that we can release our TCP version of it. So if you're really worried about the unreliability of UDP, we have TCP coming. And you can get tables and tables and tables of data, right? This is the temperature and the humidity. And if you can see it closely enough, you'll say that it says it's 2.4 degrees Celsius in here right now. I guarantee you it is not. This is just a really terrible temperature sensor. Um, it's probably off by close to an order of magnitude. The humidity is close, but also off. Um, and charts, so I can graph it over time. So now it's demo time. And for demo, I'm gonna take you, can, I hope everybody can see that. If you can't see that, raise a gripe about it in the, uh, uh, I get a, I'm, I'm seeing a thumbs up so folks can see this. Now, a little bit about this demo, first of all. This is live on the internet. You can go and you can play with it yourself. This is 1.6 billion rows of data collected from the New York City taxi uh, database and merged with a bunch of weather. And we even provided some example queries. So let's see, I will get the average trip distance, right? And I'll run that. The average trip distance is 2.9 miles, but really the fun stuff is up here, right? Execution time for that query was 1.59 milliseconds. Now, the network time was, was 400 milliseconds, but that's because this is running in a data center in London and I'm in North Carolina, so I got to go back and forth across the Atlantic, right? That's really fast for doing an average across 1.6 billion rows of data, right? That's almost unbelievably, I can, oh, my browser's frozen. I'm just gonna reload the whole thing, here we go. So that's the average, so let's do a sum across 1.6 billion rows of data. Great, 230 milliseconds. That is, as I said, blindingly fast. Um, and a couple of things to realize about this is we are not caching these results and this is not run in memory. So this is not an in-memory database. Holding 1.6 billion rows of data in memory pretty much not be possible without a ridiculous amount of memory. Um, so I'm 
quite impressed what, with this. And one of the reasons I'm uh, quite impressed with it is that IoT data is going to be billions of rows of data, right? I'm going to be collecting something once a second. You know, in a week, I'm going to have a million rows. So if I'm collecting it for years and years and years, right? 10 years of weekly gas prices, uh, 1,000 rows in 247 milliseconds. That's pretty good after going over 1.6 billion rows to get that and return 1,000. That's pretty good. I can't see if there are questions, but I do believe that I am just about out of time. So if I do have questions, I will say thank you. And I really appreciate you hanging out at this talk. Um, I know these online virtual talks are a little weird sometimes. They're weird for me too. Um, I really, really, really want to be in Malaga, Spain. So <laughs> I'd rather be there. That's why I have this nice beach background. It's trying to get me in the mood. And I'm looking forward to being there in uh, October. Thank you so much. Um, let's just give some time for people to ask any questions. Um, so everybody, you can unmute yourselves and turn on your camera if you like and ask any questions that you have. You can also send them through the chat if you're shy. And I'm trying to figure out how to unshare my screen now. But... <laughs> That's fine. We can uh, bump you off. We have a we have a question. Okay. Um, so it's from from I can't pronounce the name. I'm sorry. Um, Tatus. Uh, it says the demo looks fast. Uh, oh, sorry. Did you want to Did you want to ask your question live? Um, so basically, I was thinking like the demo looks fast, but I'll, are the results basically cached or? No, no actually, nothing is cached. These are, this, is, this is actually run in real time. Um, it's not cached. It's not in memory. It's reading from disk. Um, this is all running on a, um, on a C5 metal instance in AWS. And what I can do is... We're, you're no longer sharing your screen, David, so you'll have to I know, share. I'm putting it in the chat. Ah, okay, sorry. That's the demo right there. And um, if you give me one other second, I will give you a link to um, an article that I wrote about it in on DZone, which tells you, sort of gives you all the details uh, behind the whole thing. and. What we ended up doing was we put this live on uh, this demo up on Hacker News. And I don't know how many of you follow Hacker News, but we were on the front page of Hacker News for somewhere about six or eight hours. Um, and we took a lot of hits to our uh, demo. We had over 20,000 unique IP addresses coming in. We, did, we took something like 17,000 uh, queries. So there's the D-Zone article if you want to go. Uh, cool. Thanks. Would I use QuestDB instead of something like Postgres? Absolutely. Um, the queries that I am running in a few milliseconds or a few hundred milliseconds on QuestDB would take uh, on the order of, uh, you know, multiple seconds to multiple minutes on Postgres. Um, Postgres just isn't built for this kind of performance. Right? This was built from the ground up for very high performance. Um, and you can't access the first link. Oh, that's because I mistyped it.
that one should load right away. Sorry about that. Other questions? Hi, David. I've got a question for you. Okay. So you were working previously uh, at Influx. Yes. And now you're working for QuestDB. Um, being honest, and I mean, knowing the, the, the different tools and, and competitors, I mean, what are the, I mean, the weakness that you find right now in your, in, at QuestDB, what do you think that you should improve uh, compared to Influx? And of course, I guess that you, you are also quite familiar on the strengths and, and weakness from timescale. So comparing to those two big players, what do you think that you, need, you still need to, to catch up to, to get to that level? So uh, some of the things that we need to catch up on are, um, for instance, we are, in, and we're working on this, I've been talking to the engineers about this all morning, is we currently don't have an integration for uh, Grafana or another sort of uh, visualization front end. So building dashboards is, is something that's not quite possible right now. Um, now we're brand new, right? Um, there are seven of us in the, in the company, we're very small. Um, so we're working on that actually as we speak. Um, there are some other things that um, we know we need to work on. Uh, some of the where clauses, if you do a where clause in SQL, that can be a little slow depending on, on what the where clause is. Um, uh, in terms of where we compete against uh, time scale and influx, performance, right? Um, we outperform ClickHouse in, in you know, raw query speed. And uh, one of the thing, one of the problems that uh, Influx has is, as the cardinality of your database increases, the performance decreases quite a bit. Um, they're also not SQL; they're running on this Flux language, which can be quite powerful. But there's a learning curve in being able to write queries in that, right? Um, and again, uh, time scale is based on Postgres. And they've done some things to sort of performance tune post Postgres for time series, but uh, they're not going to come close to the kind of performance that that we're getting. Um, one of the things that our our CTO is is he is an unbelievably smart guy, and he has really aligned this, tried to get as close to the hardware as possible with this database. So it is optimized for hardware. And, and it's really been built from the very beginning for uh, very high speed access. These guys all came from uh, the trading environment, right? High speed uh, financial trading environments. And so performance was a key indicator for them. And that's really why they built this. I see. And one last question. Do you know why why none of the big players like like uh, timescale, timescale or Influx why they didn't build their own uh, user interface why they all just uh, went to integrate with Grafana or or Tableau or Click? And well, um, uh, Influx did build their own user interface, right? Um, it's just that most people don't use it; um, they use Grafana instead. Because I, I guess most, I, so it, I think historically it started out that they didn't have a user interface, so they supported Grafana, and everybody started using Grafana, and then when they built their own user interface, people were already using Grafana. So it was sort of an uphill climb to get people to use their user interface. Grafana is sort of ended up being the, the industry standard for you know, uh, visualization front end for databases.